Vice President Harris, it looks like, has closed the gap or taken the lead over Donald Trump in every swing state, according to the latest Bloomberg and Morning Consult poll. The new numbers show competitive races in all seven battleground states among registered voters. In Arizona, Harris now leads by two points after Trump led President Joe Biden by three points there in a survey that was taken earlier this month. In Georgia, the polls show that the race is tied after Trump led by a single point in the previous survey. In Michigan, Harris now leads Trump by 11 points. That's double digits, a six-point improvement on Biden's previous numbers. In Nevada, Harris has raised a three-point lead for Trump and turned that into a two-point lead of her own. She also trails by just two points in North Carolina. She's also cut Trump's lead from seven points to four points in Pennsylvania. And in Wisconsin, the poll shows Harris leading by two points after Biden led there by three points previously. We should note that with the exception of Michigan, every state's result is within the margin of error. Harris's lead in, in Michigan also varies from other polls, by the way, that have been taken since Biden exited the race, but they are kind of extraordinary numbers and show a big swift pretty fast. Those numbers come as Vice President Harris herself held a rally last night in Atlanta, drawing a very energetic crowd of some 10,000 people. She laid out the contrast between her and Donald Trump, once again presenting this election as a choice between a prosecutor and a felon. Harris also attacked the former president on border security and called him out for flip-flopping on the next presidential debate. Our administration worked on the most significant border security bill in decades. Some of the most conservative Republicans in Washington, D.C. supported the bill. Even the Border Patrol endorsed it. It was all set to pass. But at the last minute, Trump directed his allies in the Senate to vote it down. Right. He tanked, tanked the bipartisan deal because he thought it would help him win an election. Which goes to show Donald Trump does not care about border security. He only cares about himself. So here is my pledge to you. As president, I will bring back the border security bill that Donald Trump killed, and I will sign it into law and show Donald Trump what real leadership looks like. So last week, you may have seen, he pulled out of the debate in September he had previously agreed to. Here's the funny thing about that. So he won't debate, but he and his running mate sure seem to have a lot to say about me. And by the way, don't you find some of their stuff to just be plain weird? Well, Donald. you'll reconsider to meet me on the debate stage. Because as the saying goes, if you've got something to say, say it to my face. So Claire McCaskill, a lot to get through here uh, from what we saw from the vice president last night. First, it was striking. The, the border immigration is perceived as perhaps one of her biggest weaknesses. She went right there, right at the top of that rally. She addressed it head on, tried to flip it on Trump for his efforts to kill that bipartisan bill. And as we'll show you a little later in the show, there's, you know, she's got an ad on this as well. They're dueling ads. Trump has one attacking her. She's got one defending herself on this issue. Um, you know, we, the signature moment from that is going to be the say it to my face, uh, you know, about the debate, sort of goading Trump uh, to meet her in September. But I'm also just struck by the feel of last night. That crowd was huge. It was raucous. The vice president is clearly having fun on the stage. An unthinkable scene for Democrats two weeks ago. Yeah, it is a remarkable thing that we are witnessing. 
Um, this is a woman who's been underestimated by the chattering class, by people who don't know her well, people who assumed she wasn't ready to take on this kind of campaign in this way. And I think if we watch that, that, that speech last night, what struck me so much, I don't think people realize how hard it is when you're constantly interrupted with a lot of emotional outbursts of a crowd and how you pause and allow that emotion to build and how you build off of that emotion for a crescendo. It really, that was a very well done set of remarks last night. And it, it, people really don't realize how difficult that is to do it with confidence, with a smile on her face. That's the biggest contrast in this campaign now, Jonathan, is that the Democrats are having fun and it's about joy and opportunity and freedom. And the other side is about, you know, cat ladies and electrocuting boats and the stuff that most Americans are just going, well, that doesn't really move me. Yeah, and, and the weird is the word the Democrats have fixated on the last 10 days, but it's also, it's really dark. It's a dark, dark image. It's a dark image of America that Donald Trump and J.D. Yance are putting forward. And it was a real contrast from last night. And Aaron Haynes, you were there. You covered that rally uh, last night in Atlanta. Tell us a little bit more about what it, what it felt like there, how the crowd responded to her. Uh, as this is, the general election is, is in a new, such a different place. And Vice President Harris's rollout here continues to be really impressive. Yeah, I mean, Jonathan, what you saw on the screen was exactly what it felt like in that arena. I mean, the mood, uh, I, the best way I could describe it was festive, and, and it was even in leading up to uh, that electrifying 27 minute or so speech that the vice president gave, you had a parade of rock stars, political and entertainers taking the stage and really firing up a, a crowd that didn't really need much firing up. You had a DJ uh, in, in the arena, they were dancing, you know, for the three hours leading up to when she appeared on stage. And then you also have people like, uh, you know, Stacey Abrams, who is certainly still a hero in Georgia. She made, her first appearance for, for the vice president, who is now the presumptive Democratic nominee on stage. You had Senators John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock make a rare joint appearance on stage together uh, You know, in, at this rally. They don't often do that. They, hearkening back to that historic uh, 2020 election for them as well. You, then you had Megan Thee Stallion, who definitely had this crowd fired up, and, and rapper Quavo from Migos who then introduces uh, the vice president talking about their working relationship to address gun violence. So you had all these people coming out, really keeping this energy and enthusiasm going into week two of, of, of Harris's campaign uh, as she is really the de facto Democratic nominee. Uh, this is energy that I saw in Georgia in 2020, frankly. So, you know, I don't know if they can keep the same energy up for the next 98 days. That's something like 14 weeks from now. But if they can, Georgia certainly seems to be definitely back in play for Democrats. Yeah, the energy there yeah, the last night, I mean, crazy. The money there also pouring in as well. Sam, I don't know if you've got, um, if you need a little bit more money, but the, I see that Amazon is not yet selling Say It To My Face t-shirts, so there's a business uh -huh. opportunity for you. I know, I'm sure they pay you a lot of money to do way too early every morning. You do it brilliantly, mm. but um, oh, if you, you need a little bit more Say It To My Face t-shirts have to be sold, <laughs> I reckon. Look, are these polls, more seriously, uh, what do you make of this Bloomberg poll, this kind of enormous shift that we've seen? I, I, I haven't seen a shift like this during this campaign, this rapid and this distinctive, particularly that Michigan number. Uh, what are you making of that Bloomberg poll? Is this an outlier or is this a reflection of where things are headed for Democrats? Do you want me to start with the serious stuff or can I plow off of the Amazon t-shirt business idea? Go on. Go on, okay, because I, I, I hadn't thought about the t-shirt business idea, but I, I look into it, yeah, it's a, not it's necessarily no my forte. Also, Claire made a very valid point about constantly being interrupted. I know it. Uh, I've worked with Jonathan Lemire. It is a problem. It's hard to speak <laughs> when that happens. Uh, as for the polls, as for the polls, uh, look, I, I don't put my stock in any one set of polls individually. I think there's some numbers there that, frankly, are mm. head-scratching. Plus 11 in Michigan. I mean, come on. That's not going to be the case. Also, minus yeah. four in Pennsylvania, I don't think that's going to be the case either. But if you look at trends, <laughs> I think that's where you have to put your money, right? And the trends all point to the same thing, which is that Harris has gained substantially relative to what we expect in an election like this over the past two weeks. I mean, we are talking about 
three, two, three, four points across the board in the states and nationally. And I think it's just manifested in the ways that we saw at Atlanta last night. Democratic enthusiasm, which had been so bad uh, for so long, suddenly gets, you know, erupted out of this bottleneck. And you're seeing it with crowds. You're seeing it with... Uh, poll results, you're spe seeing it with uh, fundraising. I think she's made up a huge amount just on that alone. The question is, can she sustain it, build on it, and then also keep in that coalition the sort of independents, uh, the older voters that Biden did have uh, in his uh, back pocket? Uh, can she do that and create that winning coalition? And that's where the next three weeks, I think, are going to be critical.